All right. Thanks to all of you. Um, as Andrea said, the, uh, the topic of today's panel is uh, how to ensure maximum quality of translations. Uh, there are really two fundamental aims to, to the discussion. Uh, the first is to really underline the importance of, of language resources, uh, and not only for machine translation, and to look at this from various viewpoints, from both the viewpoint of translators uh, as well as uh, technology specialists. And the second central aim is to show that language resources are really of fundamental importance uh, for an efficient translation process and also for high quality translations. But really, most of all, uh, the central, the highest aim is really to introduce you to some fascinating people, uh, to keep this kind of people based. And uh, I think we have some very, very interesting panelists uh, who look at language resources from very different uh, viewpoints. Uh, today, I kind of briefly introduced them, uh, but I think they, uh, they deserve a longer introduction, and I'll allow them to do that actually themselves. Uh, so let's start with uh, Anna Kotarska. Uh, to my left, she's the, as Andrea mentioned, she's a senior specialist uh, at the Department of Analysis and Strategy. So it would also be interesting to hear more about what the Department of Analysis and Strategy does in Poland. Uh, so Anna, I'll turn it over to you for a brief introduction. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Anna Kotarska from, um, from Poland. I'm a public uh, services uh, uh, national anchor point for my country. I work uh, in uh, a public institution, National Health Fund, uh, which is a unit uh, directly subordinate to the Ministry of Health. So uh, I could say I work in the health sector. Uh, within my institution, uh, I work mainly uh, as a translation uh, project coordinator. Uh, I have quite an extensive uh, translator uh, background. I used to do translation, specialist translations uh, myself. Um, and within the institution, I also uh, in, I am involved in uh, purchasing um, activities uh, because, and I will talk about it uh, in a moment. Uh, I find that um, purchasing procedure, purchasing uh, language services, is um, the, the, success, the, key, the success factor to, to achieving quality of translation. Okay, thank you, Anna. Our next panelist is Shana Nivorti. I think she had a fantastic introduction in the previous presentation. It's kind of a nice lead up to, to what she does, but I'll allow her to tell a little bit more about herself uh, and her work as a translator for Irish. Hi. Um, so as you heard from Teresa, um, I'm translator in the Department of Culture, Heritage and the Gaeltacht. And um, as Teresa described, we do in-house translation and we also outsource because we have a small team we outsource a certain amount so um, for the last few years we've been working on the machine translation um, system that Teresa and her, and her team have developed and um, it's been a really interesting project and I think uh, has really kind of changed um, changed my uh, view of, of how of how I work like I've changed my, my work practices have changed so um, yeah, it's, it's been fascinating and uh, it's an, a very interesting topic, so um, yeah, look forward to kind of discussing it further. Okay, great. Next up, Jan Ziedinsch. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I work for Culture Information Systems Center in Latvia and mostly we are working with uh, and developing different kind of uh, culture information system, but uh, for the last uh, four years, we are uh, developing and uh, building and managing uh, our national uh, state uh, translation, uh, uh, machine translation system, Hugo.lv. And uh, now uh, we are on the second stage of development and we are moving from a single portal to uh, platform, uh, which uh, includes in a national ICT architecture and uh, of course we have uh, different uh, challenges to get uh, through but uh, uh, I think uh, we have a good, we will, we will have and uh, we have and we will have a good results in the next two years. Okay, thank you Janis. Hope to hear more about Hugo Delvi during the panel discussion. Marcus, your names come up a lot during the past couple of days. Uh, I heard that a lot of questions have been deferred to you. Uh, you finally arrived, so uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions been saved over the past couple of days, but uh, 
before we get to those, allow you to introduce yourself. So yes, I'm the head of the e-translation project uh, at DGT, so the component of actually building the machine translation system used within the EU institutions. Uh, I say e-translation, I've heard a lot of reference to MTIDC, but MTIDC is, is, I don't really want to say on the way out, but it's evolving into the next version, e-translation. Prior to that, uh, I was actually a translator up until seven years ago, so I also bring that perspective um, to the translation and language technologies game. Um, I am told, however, or I'm not really told, but I learn at conferences and when I deal with my counterpart, Daniel Pru, who spoke yesterday, that after seven years, even if you're still in touch with people, you start to miss things and you're told, oh, they don't do it this way anymore and now we do this instead and so on. Um, but I still have a view of how it was done eight years ago. <laughs> All right, thank you, Marcus. Um, I'd like to to kick off the questions um, by starting with Shana because we had a fabulous presentation about MT for Irish and probably fresh on everyone's mind. Um, we got to hear about how MT engines have been developed for Irish, but uh, uh, it seemed from Teresa's presentation that uh, a lot of these translation data is actually coming from you and from other translators. Um, I wrote down a quote from the pre previous presentation to the translators understand their data. Um, and that a lot of these batches have been provided from you to Teresa. Um, Shana, maybe you could talk a little bit about how, how you are providing this data, um, how you're making sure the data is of sufficient quality, um, and also how you've been working with MT and how you find the, how found the MT for Irish. Yeah, so um, we, because we have such a small team, as I mentioned earlier, um, our in-house quality assessment tends to be that we'll swap and have our work proofread by the other translator. Um, when it comes to the outsourced work, we'll use um, a quality assessment matrix, um, you know, because I, I think it's very important, as I'm sure many people in that situation would attest to, that um, we need to be able to uh, explain to people, explain to companies why we feel that it's maybe they're, what they've produced isn't quite up to the standard that we'd expect and, and things like that. So, I mean, it's very much, you know, human quality assessment. Um, and I think the, that the human element of MT is, you know, we really need to, to um, point it out and emphasize it. So that anybody who's sort of reticent about MT will understand that it doesn't take the place of a human translator and it shouldn't and it's approximate solution, you know. Um, and I think as well from my experience of MT that it actually like highlights the, the value of the human translator because um, as if you realize that you're just switching from uh, a translation approach to an editing approach, um, what you can gain from it, really, I feel, is that you have a lot more ownership over your work. It's sort of doing the grunt work for you, and then you have more time to personalize it, polish it, um, and you're not just sort of proofing and editing your own work, which I find is, you know, it's a, it's a great advantage. Um, mm -hmm. So going forward, like when the shared translation service comes in that Theresa mentioned earlier, um, I think like in terms of cost savings and, um, and all that, it'll be great, a great advantage and it'll also save time. And then with the assessment matrix, you know, everything working together, um, I think, you know, hopefully it'll be very successful. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a big undertaking, so yeah. I'm looking forward to um, having that combination of TM and MT. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of productivity gains have you been seeing in your own work? Do you have any like hard numbers for us? Or um, in what way has MT been allowing you to be more productive as a translator? I don't have numbers for you, unfortunately. Um, I can only give you anecdotal evidence, really. But um, I feel that I have more time to think about um, the final product. Um, a lot of our work is 
uh, it's to a tight deadline, it's quite a pressurised environment. Um, I'm sure a lot of translators understand that. Um, and the point that I made earlier about it sort of doing the stuff that you, without MT, without TM, like you're just repeating your, yourself over and over again with a lot of the things. If, 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 if a lot of your texts are similar, you know yourself, like it takes so much of your time to redo something you've done before. So because it's doing all that work for you, you can really focus on the finer points of the translation, on the, the, finished, um, the finished look of it and how um, it just, you don't feel as rushed. And I feel I just have, as I said, more ownership over it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Anna, what about you? Um, how do you manage translation quality in your organization? I mean, you work for the Department of uh, Analysis and Strategy. Do you have a, what's your strategy for evaluating or for managing translation quality? Um, uh, well, uh, most of uh, the translations uh, we do at the National Health Fund uh, are actually outsourced. So, um, let's say our uh, a direct role uh, in, in uh, supervising quality is uh, was, uh, slightly different. It's not uh, directly the in-house uh, translators uh, doing post-editing or whatever kind of checking. Um, uh, we concentrate uh, on uh, choosing uh, uh, the right partner to do the job for us. Uh, we, are, we outsource maybe 98, 99% of our translations to a languages uh, services, uh, language services uh, provider. Uh, so um, our method to um, ensure the best quality we can achieve at this point is uh, having, um, let's say, a, an efficient uh, tender procedure where we spe specify our requirements um, as precisely as possible. Uh, but after um, we have chosen um, a language services supplier. Uh, we well, we choose with uh, partnership like cooperation. We provide uh, our um, translate trans, translate um, translating translation agency uh, with, uh, for instance, translation memories uh, we have uh, as a result of our in-house translations because well, the few in-house translators we have um, work with the CAT tools and we do have our uh, own translation memories. Uh, we provide some reference materials uh, to, to, to the translation agency so they can do alignment uh, of, um, on their own, generate a term basis uh, which we as the customer can verify. Uh, so uh, there is a daily contact and, and exchange um, of knowledge uh, between us, um, so we basically work on the, um, as the on the correct terminology as the basis of the translation. Uh, translations done on both sides. Okay, so terminology is kind of your your. Uh, well, if I may add, we have also incorporated um, um, in the contract with uh, um, with the agency uh, a clause specifying that we want to receive the translation memories generated throughout uh, the whole year or a longer period of time of of, 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 of our cooperation. Mm, we, also, we still have some areas for development, which is uh, that, for instance, we, we have to, to revise uh, the agreement to be absolutely sure that we've got in EPR rights uh, to, to the translation memories, um, and because uh, we can provide, then we shall be free to, and, and willing to provide those translation memories to the LRC project. Mm -hmm. uh, and, well, this is my, my personal idea that, uh, well, a dream would be to, to, to be a word, uh, that um, if each public agency, a public institution uh, incorporated such a clause in the agreement, uh, because most public institutions in Poland have uh, outsourced uh, translations, uh, that might be a perfect source, uh, that clause about trans pro providing uh, translation memories back to the institution, that would be a perfect source uh, of uh, translation memories to, to, to be fed to, to, to the engines, but, but it is really a very long-term process. So essentially in your work um, in Poland, you're a buyer of translations. Your agency purchases, outsources translations from localization or translation vendors, and then you include a clause 
in your contracts that the vendor has to provide the translation memories following yeah. the completion of a project. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. That's how we do it. Are there any other translation buyers in the audience? Any other organizations that outsource translations to vendors? Show of hands? Okay, about five or six. How many of you have a clause in your contract stipulating that translation memory should be provided? All right, about half. No? Uh, no, no, we are on the other side, the opposite side sometimes, <laughs> I would say. We are, I guess that language services suppliers would not be so happy to, to give, give it back, yes, so the translation memories back. Has that been in your experience, that, that vendors aren't happy to give the translation memories back to you? Uh, um, this idea of putting this provision in the contract about translation memories is quite a new one in our company, so I, um, I, there is not a long history so, so that, um, of this process, so, so that I could comment whether they are much willing or not, but I would guess they are not, would not be very willing. That would be an area for much negotiation. Yeah, I think it's also an area of a lot of discussion, uh, hopefully in the, uh, the lunch break after this, uh, if any of you have any questions for Anna about how to incorporate a clause like that into your contracts, I think that'd be a, a fruitful discussion as well. Uh, Shana, what about you? Yeah, sorry, um, just on, on that topic, um, the panel that we have set up for the shared translation service um, includes that clause as well. And currently, um, although we're not uh, we don't use that panel at the moment. Some of the companies who are on that panel happen to be companies that um, our outsourced work goes to, and they um, understand that we would require the TMX files back, and we haven't had um, much resistance. I don't know if we've had any, but I know we certainly wouldn't have much resistance, um, and some <coughs> companies expect to have to provide the TMX, and then their TMX files are... Um, are fed into our system and that is all then given to the ADAPT Center to Teresa and her team so that because I realized I didn't answer that question earlier so um, we're like really incorporating as much as possible um, in order to feed it back into the MT um, just to to get back to what you asked me earlier and um, I think that clause is very important in, in the, in the tenders. So. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the audience about this? Go ahead. That's only the <coughs> translation memory that was generated by that translation. Yeah, yeah. That they had to yeah. yeah, so sometimes they're really small, sometimes they're larger documents, but like over the course of a year, that's a lot of data, you know, and when... And it's, a, it's a single file for one translation. Yes, yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so these are the... I mean, I don't want to divide it into two sides here, but it seems like we have two translators, the, the two people working on the translation side, and then two people more on the technology side, though, of course, as we heard, Marcus has been a translator for quite some time as well. Um, Marcus, uh, start with you. How do you feel about this, um, uh, the sharing of language data uh, between vendors and, and public organizations? Has this helped to contribute to the overall pool of language resources that is available to you in e-translation? I, th I think it would be very helpful. Um, at the same time, I have to admit that the, the commission itself is, is kind of suspicious. There's an in-house feeling that, uh, that only the official translators can produce perfect translations. So the policy is, in fact, that the in-house translations go into our central database. Uh, and translations that are, that are outsourced, which are supposed to be around 30% now, um, and the English department sometimes hits 50 or 60 percent because they're, they don't have enough people to deal with, with the translation load. Um, those are spot checked only and then they are not incorporated into our data and made available to us. So from the point of view of producing translations for the institutions, the internal stuff, I think we're, we're very wary about that. But e-translation, of course, has a broader base. We're supposed to work on domain-specific engines for public institutions and so on. So any additional data is useful. Um, I mean, even this suspicion that we have, it, it, it does bring me back to the days when I started using uh, Translator's Workbench at that time as opposed to Studio. 
um, and I was giving courses, and many of the translators, uh, the question that they would have is, how do I exclude everybody else's segments? I only want my own. And there's, there is always that sort of feeling, mm, I, I, I'm the best one, and I, I don't trust the others. I think that's faded away, but maybe on an institutional level within the commission, it, it still exists. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, also today, we heard a fascinating presentation from Kenneth from the University of Edinburgh about neural machine translation. Uh, I know that uh, e-translation is also shifting towards neural MT, just like everyone else. Um, how, do, how does data influence this shift? Uh, can the same data be used to train neural MT engines? Is there a difference? Uh, how are things changing? Um, currently, we're using mostly the same data. Uh, we're actually using a limited subset because we have not yet, uh, again, because of security concerns, we have not approached the, the other institutions to use their data. So we're strictly using commission data for the neural engines, whereas for the standard engines, it's the EU data from all of the institutions. Um, but we have big gaps, particularly for Norwegian and Icelandic, given that they're not, they're not EU languages. Uh, Irish, because of its status, as you've seen. Uh, so we depend on the ELRC to fill gaps uh, in those areas, uh, we have built new Icelandic and Norwegian engines, uh, which, well, they'll be active next week, and they should be in MTIDC, I hope, today, if my team is, is doing what they're supposed to be doing while I'm away. <laughs> uh, the other problem that we have, of course, well, the problem, uh, it's really what Kenneth was saying, was that we are really tuned to bureaucratic language, that's the kind of stuff that we output. I have an example in my presentation uh, after the lunch break. Um, it's something that our translators, when they're translating legislation, do not want to see changed. But if people latched onto e-translation to provide translation for their websites, they don't want to be harmonized or uh, use other bureaucratic terms in many contexts. So it's, it's crucial to add it and to build domain-specific engines for other, other users, yes. Okay, uh, Kenneth also talked about the differences in translation quality for neural MT and SMT and the comparisons. How, how do you feel about this topic? How, does, uh, how well does neural MT work for the, as you put it yourself, the legalese or bureaucratic? Yeah. Uh, uh, our approach um, is that we're working from the languages which are poorly served currently by statistical models. So uh, we've started with Hungarian, German, Finnish, Estonian. And I think there it's, it's cut and dried that the neural is far better, uh, regardless of, of fine tuning and, and uh, terminology and so on. We're more concerned about uh, languages which are already well, well uh, served by statistical algorithms, such as Portuguese, uh, the Latin languages, Bulgarian from English and vice versa. Um, and there, what we intend to do next year uh, as, we, as we switch the engines is to have the translators check and compare and see what they like better. Of course, that also raises the question of what a translator likes better to work with to generate a final translation and what is better just as a, a rough approximation of meaning for a user who wants to have a basic idea of what something means might not be the same as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Marcus. Uh, Giannis, um, in addition to being the project manager for the Culture and Information Systems Center, you also run Hugo.lv, which is the Latvian government's automated translation platform. Uh, how important have language resources been to the development of that platform? Uh, yes, uh, actually that's uh, after even three years, it's still a problem for us that uh, uh, we can gather all the data from the government because we see in uh, procurements that government still buys uh, translation from translators, a uh, lot of, in lots of uh, money is still spent. Of course, uh, we want to make everybody happy, translators, uh, government, uh, us, uh, but uh, uh, yes, it's a problem that uh, we should uh, tell uh, government organizations that data uh, the translated data is open data. Open data in Latvia is, at this moment, is hot topic, but nobody uh, thinks uh, about uh, 
translated data as open data. Every, everybody is talking about structured data, about some uh, statistical data and uh, how many people are living here, but open just that. Uh, but uh, we are now trying to tell everybody that we need also translated data and some organizations are uh, starting to, more, uh, to understand it more and more. And uh, uh, one big achievement we uh, get in the last uh, months is that uh, we have Information Society Council, which consists of uh, prime minister and ministers and different key organizations in Latvia, uh, has uh, made a memorandum uh, for Latvian transformation in digitiz uh, digitization and one point is that uh, we have to make a report and, uh, on what laws, in Latvian laws, we have to make changes so the translations uh, from uh, government organizations could be uh, available for our machine translation and uh, could, uh, they could give us centralized uh, so it's not uh, uh, just from one organization, but from all uh, government organizations in uh, Latvia. And of course we are building also easier uh, uh, way for them to give, give those data in uh, our system to just uh, put them online. So not, uh, it's, it's not like just sending some emails or any other things. And uh, also uh, one uh, interesting thing we did uh, uh, with our partner, Latvian, uh, uh, Latvian Language Center, is that we will integrate uh, a terminology portal in uh, hugo.lv, so uh, all the official terminology will be available for machine translation. And I think that's uh, great for better quality. And of course, as I said, we want to make uh, all happy. Uh, we will also uh, make our all translations uh, as open data. Our corporate will be in a diff in a special space uh, for uh, downloads and uh, see through. Yeah, great. I mean, making people happy. It's nice to see that. Uh that's the goal of Hugo Avi, which what it should be, because you know when we're talking about machine translation, it's easy to get really technical and uh, go into this kind of uh, technical shop talk bubble. But at the end of the day, we're talking about language, which is very close to uh, uh, people's hearts, as we heard in the previous presentation about Ireland. I th thought that was very interesting about how everyone who works with the Irish language is driven by pride. Uh, do you feel this is the same way in Latvia? Do you think that how is pride and pride in Latvia uh, driving your work to to build uh, a better Hugo Avi? Yeah, we, we try to we try to tell that for a bigger cause to, uh, to because the Latvian language is also a small language and uh, we have to. Uh, collect all the resources and to collect that uh, current Latvian language in uh, one place. And we, and we, s we have calculated with you, with still that it's, we have the biggest uh, Latvian uh, corpora at this moment. So I hope it will, be st it will stay the same in the future. Right. Yeah, it's also one of the most popular government services, one of the only governments to have a you know, pan-governmental machine translation platform. So. I think Latvia has gone a long way towards uh, uh, showing other governments that you know this is really a way to uh, uh, to help translators and and to make people happy, like you said yourself. Um, I guess a question for for all of you: We've talked about machine translation and, and and language data. What other tools and technologies do you think are being used or should be used um, in the translation process, uh, particularly by governments? Are there other other things you see on the forefront of uh, of technology moving into the language space? Marcus, uh, at the commission, we were very heavy on uh, on cat tools. First of all, Studio, some little band of rebels that like to use Omega T instead. Um, language uh, voice recognition was something that, uh, again, I used to use it. Um, it was it had a nice band of followers for the languages that actually have a voice recognition system. Um, my personal experience was that um, I would use it 
very happily for, for speeches, things like that. Um, a little less happily for very formal documents. And then once machine translation came up, I stopped using it because actually editing a suggestion using voice commands and so on was very uncomfortable and going through the step of saying, no, for this segment, I'm going to use voice recognition. For this one, I'm not. Uh, it was just too tedious. So it was two competing technologies and, and machine translation pushed the other one out. Um, on the other hand, what we do have very much with the written approach is uh, terminology, terminology included in the CAT tool, not directly in, uh, in machine translation. Um, and a whole, a whole system to gather, th this, it's kind of invisible to translators, but it gathers the, their translations together and then offers the, the translations via the translation memory to all of the other institutional translators, and I'll go into this a bit more in detail in my presentation. Um, but really, uh, machine translation is, is the thing that I find is getting, getting a lot of press. CAT tool has become kind of standard. Um, and other than that, the standard ones, that's, that's what we use, really. Shana, what about you? What's next for, for the Irish language? What kind of technologies would you like to see or would you require for the Irish language in addition to MT? Um, I think, um, similar to what Marcus said, what we use is fairly, you know, the standard, like, um, big one for us is the terminology database, um, Cherma.ie. Uh, um, it's it's a, a massive help to translators, um, especially if you're working in an area where you have a certain amount of knowledge, but you don't have specialist knowledge. Um, and the usual, you know, online databases and term banks and um, term bases and things like that, or online dictionaries, sorry. But um, my what I've been thinking about recently is that, you know, there was so much resistance to translation memory at one stage, you know, and. I suppose that's kind of what we're seeing now with machine translation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's just, I, th I believe that it's going the same way. Like, it's going to become the norm. It, for a lot of people, it already is. Um, and people don't even think twice now about translation memory. Um, so looking ahead, that's, that's where I see it going, you know. What about voice recognition for Irish? I know at Tilda, we're working on voice recognition and, and speech technology for Latvian. Uh, we saw a really impassioned uh, presentation at the LRC conference in Iceland about voice recognition on telephones for uh, for, I for Icelandic and wanting to have that in place. Uh, do you see that uh, a need for that as well in Ireland of voice recognition, being able to talk to your phone in Irish? Yeah, absolutely. Why not? You know, um, and there's already a project um, that's been on the go for a number of years now, Aber um, which is voice um, synthesis. Um, but I couldn't really discuss it because I don't know any more about it at the, at the moment, mm -hmm. so. Anna, what about you? Before the presentation, before the panel, you showed me a, a paper about AI being used in governments today. Uh, how is the Polish government using artificial intelligence and different technologies uh, in their own work? Uh, perhaps I will start by uh, uh, responding to what um, Markus and uh, Shona uh, said, uh, which is about the f f f technologies. Uh, that could be used. Um, I think that in Poland the situation is that uh, we are still in, in many places. I mean, public institutions, not the, not the business, uh, not business, not companies. Uh, we still work on on the standard of using CAT tools and the, the awareness that something like translation memory exists and how it can it can be used. Uh, so um, I, I really enjoyed the previous uh, presentation about how the Irish uh, government. Uh, supports uh, the, um, the development of uh, uh, using machine translation in a, in a very in a, in a very organized way. That would be my dream for Poland, and I hope to, to be able to, to, to follow the example also of, of, of Ireland. So, if you ask me about uh, artificial intelligence, I would say it's quite a far-fetched question uh, at this at this point. But um, what I'm trying to do is to um, being a public services national anchor point is to raise the awareness uh, in public institutions um, not only of the technical aspects of the tools that can be used but also uh, well 
tools um, involving the, the, the use of artificial intelligence, but, uh, um, but the future, um, but possible future uh, savings uh, it, it may bring. Um, if we look at reports issued, for instance, for, by the Deloitte, uh, Deloitte uh, company, um, using machine translation is uh, one about uh, one of the four major trends uh, for the uh, e-government, uh, but that is to, to, to bring uh, really huge, huge savings in the future. Uh, so, well, I'm trying to instill this uh, well, knowledge and awareness, and hopefully we shall, we shall get to this point. Janis, what about you? What's, uh, uh, what's in the pipeline for Hugo.lv, and uh, what can Ireland and Poland learn from Latvia in its use of language technologies? Uh, I think that uh, I think that uh, we 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 have uh, we have a, a great thing that we have one organization which uh, can work with di different uh, different sectors and we have support from uh, I I could say from the prime minister that uh, translation uh, uh, machine translation is good for government. Uh, because uh, we we see that there are uh, more and more interest from uh, different uh, government organizations which runs uh, different uh, e-services. For example, uh, we see that uh, uh, there is a plan to integrate uh, machine translation in state uh, uh, tax declaration system. Uh, so it's at this moment it's only in Latvian, but it will be in English and Russian as well. In I think in the next some months, and also uh, Latvia is, uh, is uh, will we will build a, a unified state government website for all uh, ministries and other organizations, and there's a plan to use machine translation for all the content and. Uh, we see more and more interest, uh, and and of course we have to we have to talk with uh, responsible government bodies all the time and say that uh, we have to include machine translation in the ICT architecture. It it will be a platform. It's uh, so that uh, the uh, it uh, it is more and more important. Uh, in whole uh, ICT structure in Latvia. Okay, so what can Ireland and Poland learn from Latvia? One sentence. What can you? What can they learn from Latvia and, and Latvia's uh, use of language technologies in government? As I said, they they have to talk and uh, say that machine translation helps. Uh, uh, to achieve uh, better results in, uh, for people in different uh, Europe and uh, countries. Excellent. All right. Um, I was given the signal that the panel is about over. Uh, fortunately, there's a lunch break coming up, so I'm sure lots of you have lots of questions, and especially for Marcus. Uh, that's what I heard, at least. Uh, so this is the time to do it in the, in the, in the lunch break. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the panelists. I know it's a very wide-ranging discussion, but that's what talking about translation does, especially language and especially have people from different countries. So I'd like to thank Marcus Foti from eTranslation, uh, Jan Zedings from Hugo.lv and the Culture Information System Center, Shana Ni Rorty from the uh, Department of Culture Heritage in uh, Ireland, and Anna Kotarski uh, from Poland, the National Health Fund. So thanks very much for interesting discussion, and let's uh, definitely move over to that room and continue talking about data, language, translation, and uh, culture. So thanks very much.